Hello and welcome to this presentation on busting study in the US myth for disabled international students. This presentation has been brought to you by the US Consulate General Mumbai and Education USA Mumbai. My name is Ryan Pereira and I'm the regional officer at the United States India Educational Foundation Mumbai, where I supervise the Fulbright activities in Western as well as Education USA activities in Western India. The goal of this USIEF is to promote mutual understanding between the people of India and the US. This talk, this topic is very, very important to us today because the 26th of July yesterday was the 30th anniversary of the ADA, the Americans with Disability Act. And the goal of the ADA is inclusion for all. A couple of points before we get started. An Indian sign language interpreter on camera throughout the screen. In addition to that, we also have live captioning, which is available at the link provided in the chat box. So on the right hand side, right at the bottom, you'll see that. If you triangle, you'll get a link on where you could get live captioning and instructions for the live captioning is in the box above that called handouts, where you'll get instructions on how to access the live captioning. So once again, welcome to this talk. My colleague, Dr. Deborah Rosario, will now introduce the speakers. Over to, over to, over to you, Deborah. Thank you, Ryan, um, and good evening, everyone. My name is Deborah Rosario, and I'm an Education USA advisor. I'll be moderating this session. Um, in today's session, we plan to go over an overview of the Americans with Disabilities Act, an overview of how US universities have adapted to this act to support um, international students with physical, psychological, and learning disabilities, both in terms of infrastructure and support services. And we will also be hearing from a current Indian student with a disability on his experience of studying in the US. Um, we have a panel of three speakers joining us today. And after the panel addresses us, there will be time for questions at the end. Um, so you are very welcome to send us your questions. Um, there is a questions pane within the control panel um, of this webinar, and you can type in your questions, uh, your questions there and we will receive them. Um, and now before we begin, let me introduce our speakers for today. So um, in the order in which they are speaking, we have um, Monica Malhotra. Monica is um, the program manager with the National Clearinghouse on Disability and Exchange at Mobility International USA, which aims to increase participation of people with disabilities in inclusive international exchange programs. Previously, Monica worked for 10 years at the University of Texas at Austin, where she assisted with various roles, including admission, immigration, as an international student advisor, and in other student services and programs as well. Her past experience includes serving four years on the board of the Multicultural Refugee Coalition and interning with the East West Institute in New York. Monica earned her bachelor's degree in sociology from the University of Texas at Arlington and her master's degree in international studies from the University of Exeter, UK. Um, our second speaker is Justin Lozano. Justin is the director of the Disability Resource Center at Missouri State University in Springfield, Missouri, USA. He's a graduate from Missouri State as well, ultimately earning his master's in student affairs and higher education. He started working with students with disabilities as an undergraduate student and has been in the disability resource field professionally for nine years. And we are also very happy to be joined by Sunny Shah. Sunny, originally from Mumbai, is now a second year 
master's student in computational and mathematical engineering at Stanford University. He previously earned a Bachelor of Science with a double major in biochemistry and mathematics from the U University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Sunny has a bilateral hearing loss and has had um, implants since the past 18 years. Sunny will be sharing about his experience of studying in the US as an international student with a disability. Um, so I believe Monica is going to start the session. Over to you, Monica. Thank you. Um, as Deborah said, my name is Monica Malhotra. I'm the Program Manager for Mobility International USA. And first, to thank Education USA Mumbai office for organizing this event. It's really important as we talk about studying in the US that people with disabilities know that this is a definite opportunity for you as well. You can continue to the next slide. Deborah, can you go to the next slide? So Ryan introduced the anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which just happened yesterday. And <clears throat> I just wanted to briefly discuss what this important law is. Um, it is a civil rights law that banned discrimination against people with disabilities um, all across the US. And it promised to open up all aspects of American life to people with disabilities, including employment, transportation, public accommodations, telecommunications, and access to state and local government programs and offices. Um, to the right, you can see an image of protests in streets in, I believe it's New York, um, with a banner that says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, which it's <clears throat> a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. And the protest includes most people with wheelchairs down the street. Um, Many students believe because it's titled the Americans with Disabilities Act that it only protects Americans, but it's so important to know that the ADA also applies to international students and protects all students studying in the United States. Uh, briefly wanted to mention another law, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, um, what, you will, what you will see really in place at colleges and universities in the US. This law prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability and programs or activities that receive federal financial assistance um, from the US Department of Education, which is most universities in the United States. And because of this really big um, historic 30th anniversary of the ADA, um, this event is happening today, but there's many activities that are happening throughout the whole year to celebrate this 30th anniversary. And so I mentioned that I'm from the National Clearinghouse on Disability and Exchange Project with Mobility International USA. Um, so I will, you can continue to the next slide. Yep. Um, I'll use the word NCDE and clearinghouse interchangeably throughout this um, portion of my presentation. Pictured here is an Indian student who came to study in the US. He's blind. Um, he came to study high school for one year in the US and he's standing at his very colorful walkers. Um, so the NCDE is an ongoing project. It's been going on for 25 years with the goal to increase the number of people with disabilities participating in all types of international exchange programs. So international exchange includes studying abroad, so Americans with disabilities studying in different countries, or international students that want to come study in the United States teach programs, research, volunteer, or internships abroad. So we use this word exchange because there's so many opportunities that people with disabilities um, have access to and should be accessing. Um, the Clearinghouse is sponsored by the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, just as the Education USA office, and is administered by Mobility International USA. Um, Deborah mentioned that I worked at the University of Texas at Austin with international students. And during that time, I realized that there wasn't that many international students studying in the US or at our university. And this made me realize that students in their home countries weren't realizing that this was an opportunity. So it's really exciting to see the Clearinghouse as a project that's focused on dispelling myths and educating the community about access and resources to make this possible. The Clearinghouse um, services are 
run in twofold. Um, so under one umbrella, we support individuals with disabilities, parents, family members um, on providing resources and information on how to plan for an inclusive program. And on the second hand, we work with organizations and institutions that send and receive international exchange participants. Um, so that could be universities, that could be the Education USA office if they're advising a student who's deaf or who's a wheelchair user and trying to find out what programs to apply to and what kind of preparation they should um, consider. We also work with, for, um, work with disability organizations to make sure they can support and kind of um, join the planning to support students with disabilities planning their programs. The types of resources we provide are free. They're free um, information and resources and we um, produce more, most of our resources online. So one of the biggest things we do is provide a free inquiry and re referral service. So we provide very in-depth research to individuals' questions, if it's a person with a disability or an organization. So sometimes we get questions from a student, let's say who's a wheelchair user that might be studying in um, Virginia, and then they they want to understand different resources, disability organization, what public transportation is like. So our organization will provide more in-depth research than sometimes you can find online. Um, through that service, we also have over 2,000 alumni that we're connected to in our database. So we also like to introduce you to other people with disabilities that might have similar experiences. Maybe they came from India and are have a similar disability, and so that's a good peer connection that we're happy to connect you with. Um, we have over 500 online resources, um, which I will show you in just a moment. Um, tip sheets, alumni stories, best practices. Um, we have print and digital publications that also include podcasts, um, magazines, videos, and they're all available in alternative formats, so they are accessible for people who are blind deaf <clears throat> or learning disabilities. Go to the next slide. You can go to the next slide, Deborah. And so I'm going to take you on a tour of our website um, just to be able to show you. There's a lot of information on our website and I just wanted to kind of show you directly so you don't get too lost. You can share, let me share, we go. Okay, and I'm gonna show you the screen. So this is our MyUSA homepage. And so some of the most important things I want you to look at, um, to the right, there is a button that says search our resources. So if you go there directly, it'll take you to a filtered search page. Since there's so many things and so many resources here, I wanted to be able to explain some of these to you. Um, we've got tip sheets, so this can be, you know, if you're a wheelchair user and it might be your first time flying overseas, there are some tips for um, air travel for wheelchair users. Um, there's also personal stories, best practices, especially for organizations that might be supporting um, individuals with disabilities studying in the U.S. And we featured many Education USA offices globally under those best practices. You can filter by disability type. So if you are deaf or hard of hearing, you have a learning disability, physical disability, you can click on that one um, to filter by that. And then also traveler coming to the US, so that would be for you. Um, there's over 200 resources for people coming to the US. And then you can also filter by exchange type. If you're interested in studying in the U.S., volunteering, teaching, then filtering by those focuses. And you can also um, read more about to filter by origin. So we've got three stories from students from India um, and then also Americans who went to India. So you can read some of those um, resources, which are always fun. And so back to our home page, um, under access, there's one for coming to the U.S. So I'd recommend clicking that one and opportunities in the U.S. So this will take you to um, studying in the U.S., um, 
different resources for students preparing to study in fine colleges, and then financial options. Um, it's very expensive and sometimes challenging to fund studying in the U.S., and so there are some scholarship opportunities that we've listed. There's not many scholarships for students with disabilities, but there's scholarships for all students, and many of those scholarships are searching for people with disabilities because they want more diverse applicants and recipients of those scholarships. Okay. If you can go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, and so you can go to the next slide. And so <clears throat> many students will, you know, I think this presentation is titled really well with busting study in the U.S. myths. Um, sometimes these myths can really stop students from considering to come or going all the way through what they're planning for studying in the U.S. Um, some of these concerns include the difference in disability terminology. It's like I'm not understanding some of the communication or how, you know, that can be difficult sometimes. Um, and who and how to communicate about your disability needs. Is it the disability office, international office? You know, you're arriving to sometimes very large offices or campuses, and so sometimes it can be difficult to navigate that system. Um, understanding what is considered a reasonable accommodation and not adjusting to accommodations entering a new disability culture that can be really shocking you're not only entering a new culture but a disability culture on top of that um, can be a little bit difficult how to ask for support and sometimes many international students will assume that it's too independent in the u.s and it'll be difficult um, to adjust and it's important taking these all of these considerations you know it's very important to prepare ahead of time and to plan um, each of these you can understand more and it shouldn't be anything that stops you or prevents you from studying in the u.s um, <clears throat> planning ahead of time can be working with your advisor at the education usa office connecting with our office um, talking with your campus with the disability office and really understanding um, more about these things and if you do have any concerns maybe um, there's one of these that's a bigger concern for you so just addressing that and seeking um, support and the information to really help you um, and i just kind of put a the myth here that there is too much independence in the u.s so no one will help me when i'm when i need it and the fact is that because of the ada um, americans are used to their rights they know what their rights are so they are more independent and they have, um, everybody has their own needs and it's not all blind people have the same needs or all deaf people have the same needs and each individual does. And so Americans will not assume um, that someone needs help or what that help looks like. Um, so it's really important for the person to be able to ask for help. And once you do, Americans are open and happy to help. Um, so yeah, don't let that be something that stops you. You can go to the next slide. And pictured here is a student, an international student who studied in Colorado and he's blind and he's at the top of a snow slope, um, ski slope, and he's got a vest that says blind skier and he's with somebody um, that has a vest that says guide. And so he enjoyed this activity um, during his studies at Colorado. When you're thinking about applying to the U.S. and considerations, there's no real, you know, there's different, um, all students are under the same qualifications. So it's based on your academics, um, any of your additional activities. So there's no difference in your um, qualifications based on somebody without a disability. Um, and so as you're planning, there's no limits for what colleges you're looking at or you know anything like that um, focus on your academic goals first uh, what is your goal to study in the u.s is it uh, mechanical engineering is it business is it psychology 
Um, so focus on what your academic goals are first, and then other considerations would be the environment. <clears throat> maybe you don't want to be in snow like the student, and maybe you want to be closer to the ocean or different, different bodies of water. Um, think about yeah, the climate, if it's hot or cold, and activities. Maybe you want to be involved in different adaptive sports or different activities. And also look at accessibility of the town and the campus. If you're a wheelchair user, then maybe it might be a little bit difficult if it's a very hilly campus. Um, but then also look at different housing accommodations and um, transportation. Because it's a hilly you know, campus doesn't necessarily mean that you should not um, choose that one because there's a lot of transportation and buses available. So that can also support you if you do really want to go to that college. Um, and also look at the campus and community resources and what you have access to. So then you can look at more of the holistic support that you'll have. And with our office, we often, this is another dispelling a myth, but um, we often get questions from students saying, you know, I'm a wheelchair user, what schools will accept me? I'm a deaf student, uh, what schools are there for me? And all schools, you're eligible to apply to any college and the ADA applies to all U.S. colleges and universities, so you don't have to limit it to certain schools <clears throat> that you think are only for um, people with disabilities. Go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. <clears throat> and speaking of resources, talking about campus and community resources, there's an abundant amount of resources that you'll find at a U.S. campus. And <clears throat> some of these include the Disability Office, the International Office, Multicultural Center, Tutoring Study Skills, the Health Center, Counseling Services, Adaptive Sports, um, Student Housing, and pictured here is an Indian um, Oh, Indian woman who is at a race uh, riding a adaptive bicycle um, with other women and so there's a lot of activities that she was very involved at her US campus in sports and so and as a Paralympian too um, so there's so many additional activities that you can be involved in um, different community resources uh, centers for independent living this can really help first providing independent living training skills if this is your first time living on your own as well as with a disability, um, <clears throat> disability specific organizations, cross disability, um, looking at organizations that support students with all types of disabilities, online resources, there's our clearinghouse. So at any stage during your program when you're applying and even when you return home, you can always connect uh, with our office with the clearinghouse. And, and now I believe you can continue to the next slide. And Justin, I know, is going to also share some more about um, the disability resources and campus resources. And thank you. All righty. Hello, everyone. My name is Justin Lozano. I'm the director of the Disability Resource Center at Missouri State University. And I just want to say thank you for letting me have the opportunity to uh, talk with you all today. And um, it's my pleasure to be here. And just so you know, um, when we're telling Deborah to advance the slides, there's a little bit of a lag. So we appreciate your patience as we're going through um, our presentation with you. So um, we'll go ahead and get started, though. So go ahead, Deborah, if you can go to the next slide for me, please. Alrighty. So I want to talk about what a disability resource center or disability services office does um, at a university. But one thing that's really important for you to know is just how to find it, um, because there's not a standard name for our offices. You can see a whole variety of um, office names for the disability resource center. Um, for today's presentation, I'm calling this the disability resource center because that's what we're called. So that's just the easiest for me. Um, but when you're looking at a university, search for different terms such as disability access, accessibility, or accommodations. That'll usually lead you to the right area in terms of um, finding our office. Um, but some various names you might see for a disability resource center is the Access Office, the Office for Disability Support Services, the Abilities Office. Um, so just when you're doing those searches, 
realize you might see some different names, um, but then also make sure you're connecting to the office that works with student accommodations. Because like here at Missouri State University, we do student accommodations, but then there's another office that does employee accommodations. So you just wanna make sure you hit the one that gets the students. Alrighty, next slide for me, please, Deborah. All right, so the purpose of a disability resource center, um, the, the main purpose is to meet with you and to determine those reasonable accommodations to make sure that you have equal access in your academics, but also your housing and your activities. And I wanna make sure you pay attention to that because when we help provide you support, it doesn't just end at the classroom, it's about the whole college experience. And so I'll definitely talk about that here at the end um, about how that might work. Um, but also when we are providing you accommodations, um, we also collaborate with pro and provide support to staff and faculty about how to implement those. Cause sometimes they get a little confusing or they're not sure how to apply it in their classroom. So we'll provide them that support. And then of course we also provide training and education to students uh, but also faculty and staff on how we can create a more inclusive campus for people with disabilities. Um, I know here at Missouri State at least but many um, universities and disability resource centers at those universities we believe in proactive inclusion. We don't believe in um, waiting for you to have to request something or having to um, wait for something. We think you should have the same experience as your non-disabled peers at the same time. Um, doesn't mean there's lots of reactive things we have to do but our goal is to try to make it proactive and include you from the get-go. Next slide, please. All right, so what is the process to uh, receive accommodations at a university? Um, most of this is pretty standard. Um, so typically what would happen is that go to the Missouri, uh, go to the university's website, excuse me, and look for something that says requesting accommodations or establishing accommodations. Almost always it's going to be an online form, but some universities still use paper forms. Um, or if you ever need to request a paper form, please feel free to request that, that's totally fine. Um, also, be prepared to support, uh, provide any supporting medical documentation. Um, it's not always required. Uh, what we have been guided to do by our national organization is that we really want to listen to you and you're the best expert at your disability. However, some universities do want medical documentation to support that. Um, my rule of thumb is that the more non-apparent your disability is, the more likely you might need to provide some medical documentation and the most recent, the better. And so it doesn't have to be like a whole medical record or a whole patient file, but it's something from your physician that talks about your diagnosis, some of the barriers that you experience related to that diagnosis. That's really all we should be looking for. Um, so just kind of be prepared for that and it's best to submit it when you're also requesting those accommodations. So that way the advisor you meet um, will have a chance to review it before they talk with you. Um, once you submitted your request, they're going to schedule a meeting with you and um, schedule a meeting with an access advisor or an access specialist is what we typically call them. And then in this meeting, you're going to participate in the interactive process. And I'm going to expand on that here in a little bit, but the interactive process is just a fancy way of saying we want to talk to you. Okay, next slide, please. All righty. And then once you have... Um, met with that advisor, they're going to determine any reasonable accommodations and they also might make referrals for you. And so um, Monica did a good job of talking about different resources that are on a college campus. That's one thing about the university experience here um, in the United States. There are so many resources for you to take advantage of and for you to help support you, but also to have fun. Um, and we always, lots of times we'll say that it's a free resource to you. Well, really, if you look at your bill, you've already paid for the resources actually. So we want you to get your money's worth out of your experience. Um, so basically make sure you speak up and utilize those resources because they're for you to use at any time. Um, when we determine those accommodations, we're going to create for you what's called an accommodation memo or an accommodation letter. And what that basically is, it's just a, it's a document that's going to say, here's what the student's accommodations are. Um, but that document doesn't say anything about your disability, just says your accommodations. So one thing to understand when you're here um, in the States is that you're in control of your information. 
So if you don't want your instructor to not know about your disability, that's within your rights to do so. Um, but we hope that you're willing to talk about it because it gives them a little bit of background of why you have those accommodations. And it might actually provide them more um, insight to give you more support or to do something to make your the college experience more inclusive for you. Um, but you don't have to talk about your disability if you don't want to, just your accommodations. Um, and the big thing to uh, implement those accommodations is to make sure you take your accommodation memo and give it to your instructor. Um, don't just email it, don't just drop it off in their mailbox or in their office. You'll wanna have a thorough conversation with them because certain accommodations might apply a little different in, um, in their classroom. And so, but that's what we're here for as the Disability Resource Center and the Access Advisor is to help support you in how you do that conversation. Um, if you are unsure of how to approach that conversation with your instructor, we've even went with you to the instructor's office. Um, you'll still be the one doing the talking, but we can be the support to help you guide, guide you through that conversation. All righty, next slide, please. Okay, so I said earlier I was going to talk about the interactive process. So I know sometimes this can feel a little intimidating because basically you have this total stranger who's coming to you and asking you lots of questions about your disability and about how you live, how you your daily living goes and that sort of thing. And I want to promise you it's not meant to be intrusive. We're just trying to really understand um, how your disability affects you, but also how the environment related to your disability affects you. Because sometimes it's not so much your diagnosis, it's more the fact of the environment that we created that's creating more of the barrier, not the diagnosis itself. So just to be prepared when you're going to um, interact a process or an interview with an access advisor, um, some questions we might ask is just telling us more about who you are. Um, we wanna know your interests because we get emails and things all the time about opportunities, internships, spring break trips that might apply to you or might apply to your major. And we wanna make sure that you have that knowledge and that information. Um, we'll definitely wanna know about your diagnosis. Um, and we wanna know just how it affects your daily living. So not even school, but just if you are um, you know, going about your day, any impacts that, that might, uh, you might experience. We also sometimes wanna know what medications you might take and not necessarily the names of them, but what do they do, um, how they help you. But then also we know that sometimes medications have side effects that can have create some barriers for you. And so sometimes we might have to provide accommodations um, because of the medications you take and that's totally fine. Um, that's what we're uh, here to do and to, to support for you. Um, we'll also talk about housing. So if you are coming to um, the States and you're coming to live on our campus, are there any barriers related to your disability and housing? And so keep in mind that when you come to a college campus, sometimes it's, uh, you know, you have a roommate and you're sharing one bathroom, and then sometimes you are in a room and you are sharing one big community style bathroom that has five or six toilets, five or six showers in there. And so it's, that's why we're asking you those questions because maybe your disability, you might need to have a private room or you might need to have a private bathroom. Or maybe if you're deaf or hard of hearing, how are you going to hear if there's a fire alarm going off? So we might install like a flashing doorbell or a flashing light in your room so that you can be alerted when you need to leave the building if something's on fire, okay? So that's why we ask you those types of questions. Next slide, please. Alrighty. We're also going to talk to you about just a classroom situation. So we might throw a couple hypothetical situations at you. So if you are sitting in class and I'm your instructor and you're just trying to take notes, you're trying to listen, you're trying to absorb information from the instructor, any barriers related to your disability um, and sitting in class that you might um, feel uh, you need some support in. Um, we'll ask you how you study and how you prepare for class. Um, you know, are you a visual learner? Are you an audio learner? Um, you know, how do you really prepare? How do you read your books? How do you read your notes so that you're prepared for the next day's class? And we'll also talk to you about taking an exam. So if I say, hey, here's your exam. You have one hour to take your test. Any barriers that you might experience related to that? And exams can kind of vary. It could be just a multiple choice question exam. It could be a short essay exam. It could be one question and you're supposed to write three or four pages about that question. And so we wanna ask you those things so that we can make sure we are providing the proper accommodations related to your exams. And then also any technology that you might use. And so one thing that we've kind of noticed from any international students coming to um, here at Missouri State is that they're pleasantly surprised about how much technology is here and available for you to use to help provide greater access for you. So um, we want to know about the technology you use, if you use any, but then we might introduce you to some new technology and train you on that and see if that might help you while you're in the classroom. 
All righty. Next slide, please. Okay, so you might be wondering, well, what accommodations are available to me? And so that's kind of a hard question to ask because really we tailor it to the individual person. And so you might have two people with the exact same diagnosis, but completely different needs and supports. And so we're um, there's not like a cookie cutter, you know, if you have this diagnosis, you get these four things. That's why we talk to you and make sure that we tailor it to you. Um, and so it's based on your experiences and the barriers we might foresee in your experience. Um, but then also know that after you've had your initial meeting, it doesn't mean you have to, those are the only accommodations for your um, college experience. You might hit a class and you might hit a barrier that you weren't expecting, and we may not expect it either. So you by all means get back on the uh, calendar of your access advisor so that you can kind of talk through that. Um, one very good example is that many programs here, um, you may have an internship experience or a practicum experience. And so when you're having to go out into the community and um, do work, that accommodation foundation process might look a little different than when you're just sitting in a classroom um, listening to your instructor. So by all means, feel free to request those new accommodations, or if you have a current accommodation you think needs to be modified, that's what we're here for to talk through and make sure that we have the proper accommodations in place. And we can even um, tailor the accommodation specific to a certain class. Next slide, please. And so just some common accommodations that we do typically see with many um, students is extended time on your exams and quizzes. Maybe you need a smaller environment because sometimes we're in classrooms that have 100, 200, 300 people. And so maybe you just need to be able to take your test where you're only in a room of five or 10 people. Um, note taking assistance is one where maybe you have someone who's taking notes um, where you get a copy of those notes or you get those notes ahead of time, or maybe even being able to audio record those lectures. Uh, I talked about this er earlier where you might need a private room in the residence halls, um, but then also I list accessible site um, because basically anytime you go to a college campus, you should be able to have access to um, any building, any room on campus. Now, what's cool with some college campuses is that they're very old and so they have some pretty cool buildings, but obviously when they were built probably in the early 1900s, they weren't thinking about disability at that time. And so an accommodation literally might be if we're in a building that you can't access because you're a wheelchair user or you have a physical disability, we can actually move that classroom to somewhere else to make sure that you have access to that classroom. So that's why it's really hard for us to say no um, to a request without us doing some research because we will literally move the classroom if we need to to make sure that you can get access to it. And then the last one too um, that's pretty common is alternative format for your textbooks. So that might mean taking a paper textbook but turning it into a braille for a blind user. Or it could be turn it into an audio format if you're someone who lives with a reading disability or a processing disability. And that's one thing I want to make sure that you all know is that we um, serve all sorts of disabilities, apparent and non-apparent. So that could be physical, health, sensory, but also learning disabilities, processing difficulties. Um, we have several students who are in recovery, um, remission from cancer, um, all sorts of different things. So by all means, um, the university experience is open to you no matter what your disability is. All righty, next slide, please. All right, so um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I do want you to know what the philosophy of a disability resource center typically is. And so we're going to talk about self-advocacy, self-determinism, and universal design. Next slide, please. Monica kind of touched on this earlier when we were, uh, when she was discussing about needing to speak up. And that's the biggest thing when it comes to the college experience here in the United States, is that you have all these resources, you have all these people here, but you're the one who's expected to advocate for your accommodations. So what's cool is that, as I stated earlier with the accommodation memo, you don't have to go into your disability if you don't want to with people, but understand that there's a greater responsibility on you to advocate for yourself, to make sure that you're receiving your accommodations and to speak up if you're feeling like you're not getting those accommodations. Um, so when it comes to providing that um, support for you, it's not just the Disability Resource Center, but it's also you and it's also the instructor who is involved in that process. So just definitely please make sure you um, speak up because what happens is our goal is to provide you that equal access, 
but you're still doing all the work. Um, we still expect the same rigor and um, intensity as your other classmates, um, but we're providing those accommodations to give you that equal playing field. So definitely speak up and definitely make sure you consult your advisor if you have questions about how to accomplish certain things. Next slide, please. Alrighty. And the one thing that hopefully you will see when you're doing your research at other universities and disability resource centers is that they talk about universal design, or we may call it inclusive design. And what this concept is, this was originally um, created when it comes to building or construction environments. And it's universal design is the design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. And so on the screen, there's an image here of a staircase that's going up to a building, um, but you'll see a, hand, a couple handrails, but then also you have um, a ramp that is zigzagging through the stairs. And why I like this image is that, um, you know, if you're someone who can use the stairs, you can use the stairs, but if you're someone who needs a ramp, you can use the ramp, but it all goes to the same entrance of the building. And so what's pretty common is that you might see, like here at Missouri State, we have our administration building where it's very pretty at the front and we always put it on all our materials, but it's all stairs. And so if you're a wheelchair user or someone with a physical disability that can't navigate stairs, you have to go all the way around to the back of the building in order to have access. And so that might meet the requirements of the ADA, but to me, that's not inclusive. You should be able to go in the front door just like anybody else. And so we talk about universal design that when we're creating a building or a room or a program from the ground up, we should be thinking from all sorts of different users. And so, for example, with this image, you know, we're thinking about someone who might be a wheelchair user getting access to the building, but I bet the person who's a new parent that has a baby in a baby stroller would probably like that ramp too. Or the person who's delivering your product, your um, your package to your front door, they probably like that ramp as well. So that's why it's not just disability that universal design helps, it's other folks too. And so this, also, this concept also goes to, um, when it comes to the academic classroom or the, um, how we teach material. And so as I stated earlier, you know, like I'm very much a visual learner, but someone else is an audio learner. And universal design also talks about, you know, the things that we should be doing from, from the start. And so, you know, for example, you're gonna hear from Sunny here in a little bit, uh, you know, when it comes to captioning videos, should Sunny have to request every video to be captioned or should the university already have those videos captioned? And then when he shows up the class, it's already done, right? So it's once again, we're doing it from the get-go, not reacting to something because we didn't think about it. So that's what universal design is. Next slide, please. Alrighty, and so when you come to, um, you know, the college experience, do know that you have rights as a student on our campus. Um, it's called the Americans with Disabilities Act, but just because you're an international student doesn't mean you have rights here. You do absolutely have rights. So as a student with a disability on campus, if you feel like you're not receiving your accommodations or if you feel like you're not you're being discriminated against, whether that's your disability, your race, ethnicity, or religion, you can file a complaint to resolve that issue. Next slide, please. Um, so when you're searching for an office to maybe file that complaint or at least talk about what's going on, usually it's under the terms equity or compliance, or you might search the ADA coordinator. Um, they're the ones who would handle those complaints. And of course, the uh, one thing when it comes to filing a complaint, I'm sure that provide that creates a lot of anxiety to think you're about to, you know, maybe tell on an instructor or get that instructor in trouble. And you might be afraid of retaliation and you should not be afraid of, afraid of retaliation whatsoever um, for filing that complaint. Um, that's all within your rights. And if you ever do receive, uh, feel like you receive retaliation because of filing a complaint or consulting for support to, um, to help you, um, document that, but also report that to the equity compliance officer immediately so that um, it can be resolved. All right, next slide, please.
Okay. And the one thing I want to hit home that had Monica had already started to is that please know the college experience, you have rights to every bit of it. Okay. So um, it's not just your classwork, but it's also in housing, it's student activities. You can play in all the intramural sports you want. Um, we do sponsored spring break trips or service learning trips that you are welcome to participate in. Um, we have, we call it Greek life, but it's fraternity and sorority life. Um, we have so all sorts of college athletic games, so um, football, um, basketball, baseball, that you are available and able to come to. And then also you can work here at the university and also be a part of student government. Um, so I recall one of my first experiences here at Missouri State, having a student who was blind from Russia, thinking she couldn't go on a camping trip because she was blind. And you absolutely have every right to that experience just like anyone else. And so if you wanna go on an experience or if you wanna do something here on campus, um, but you may need an accommodation to do that and that's totally fine that's what we're here to do so definitely uh, make sure that you know that anything you want to do at a college campus that your non-disabled peers do you ab absolutely can, can as well all righty okay so that is all the slides i have and i'm happy to answer questions here at the end so what i'm going to do is hand you over to sunny and so you can hear from him as a student here um, about their experience and how um how it's going so sunny it's all yours Hi everyone. So I'm currently a second year master's student at Stanford University and th throughout both my undergraduate and my grad career, I've had positive experiences. So like during my undergrad um, classes, I initially applied for my accommodations and I met with uh, my liaison at the disability office and we sat down and we talked about the different um, obstacle that I face and how I usually should go about it and what other accommodation I can request for in my classes. And so we sat down, we discussed all the different possible options that I have. For example, I could request for video captioning or um, I could ask for, you know, like I can ask for a note taker just in case I cannot hear the professor during class or something like that. So I can always have some notes to study from. Um, so we ended up having a really nice conversation and like we ended up deciding that because I already have a good sense of hearing um, since I've been using cochlear implants for so long, I've decided that I would wait till the first week of classes until I meet my professors in person, then only would I, then only I will decide if I need any accommodation. So for example, before the semester starts, I would normally email all of my professors, like maybe two months before the semester starts, I would email them my letter of accommodation and say that, hey, like I wouldn't disclose my disability, but I would list that, you know, I require these accommodations and that I usually wait for the first week of classes and then decide if I need a particular accommodation. So in the beginning of my undergraduate career, when I had, you know, classes of like 800 students in huge auditorium, I couldn't hear the professor. So in those cases, the disability office actually lended me uh, something similar to an Apple system, which was super convenient because I could hear the professor much clearer. But as I progressed through my undergraduate career and um, my classes became much smaller, um, you know, we ended up having a class of maybe 15 to 20 students. In those classrooms, I, it was easy for me to understand the professor. And so I did not require those accommodations, but the accommodation that I required were more like video captioning or speech to text services. And honestly, like that may improve my um, educational experience, both in undergrad and in grad school. I've had an amazing experience, you know, with my last quarter at Stanford being completely online and having to deal with Zoom meetings. Um, the disability office has done a very good job of like giving me uh, reliable accommodations such as speech to text services or transcripts of all the Zoom meetings to which I can refer back to and then make my note accordingly. And um, if professors have released videos, they would, um, the disability office would get them um, captions, which was convenient. And the best thing was that 
um, if the videos were too long, you know, maybe like two hours long, um, and that would, you know, take time because transcribing a two hour video would take a long time. And so that put an additional pressure on me because of deadlines for homeworks and stuff like I do not have time to cover the material and time to submit my homework on time, you know. So I talked to a couple of my professors and they were gracious enough to give me an extension on my homework so that I can go through the material and work on the questions on my own time and turn it in, um, you know, by the extended deadline. And this kind of accommodation was super helpful. And I feel that you should try and get the best accommodation. You don't, you don't need to go for all the accommodation. You should just select the one that works best for you. Um, so like, for example, I personally do not understand videos. So I need video captioning and Sometimes, most of the times, my professors would always paste a blackboard and talk, in which case I would never be able to hear them. So in the beginning of the semester or the quarter, I always made it a point to go introduce myself to the professor and tell them like, you know, hey, I'm Sunny and I have a letter of accommodation from the disability office. And I would appreciate it if you could turn around and face us when you're talking or um, if a student asks a question, you know, someone from the audience, um, the, I would always request a professor to repeat the question so that I know what's being discussed. So the whole concept of self-advocacy is very important. It ultimately would allow me to have a level playing field. And so like, um, it's very crucial um like sometimes like i remember during the um online classes i would have trouble during office hours because there were too many people asking questions and stuff so i sent an email to the tas requesting that they could like you know maybe ask one person to speak at a time and repeat those questions so that i can understand what's actually happening during the discussion and so the all experience of you know having a disability office is very very helpful and made my experience living in the u.s a very positive one um in fact for the next coming years i've requested for an apartment with um depth friendly accommodation so like um maybe a strobe alarm i think yeah yeah i've requested for strobe alarm and in addition to the other appliances that I've ordered, you know, like a vibrating alarm clock and stuff like that, I also have specific important accommodations for my apartment and for classes as well. Studying in the US has been a, a really amazing experience. I've met other students with disabilities, not via the disability office, but in other classes because everyone knew that I was the one who would request a professor to, you know, repeat the questions or I would always wear colorful cochlear implants and stuff like that. So I met other students with different disabilities and understood their way of living life. And I also tried to, you know, learn different ways of advocating for myself. And in fact, one of the most interesting experiences that I've had was um, talking to other deaf students, uh, understanding how they've navigated their college life and what kind of accommodation they've requested. And all of those discussions have, you know, um, helped me with managing my classes, my lab internship, um, navigating office hours, you know, asking questions to different people, talking to the TAs or maybe asking a friend to um, give me their notes and stuff like that. So, you know, you should always like request for accommodation when you need them. Um, it's always a good experience. And I've had one experience where I didn't, I asked for accommodation, but the professor wasn't willing to give them. Um, in that case, I actually emailed my disability office and they were gracious enough to, you know, step in to that discussion and say that, uh, you know, say firmly that the professor has to give us accommodations 
and that was you know very inclusive experience and i felt that you know the university actually generally wants me to study and like you know perform the best of to my potential and yeah that's all i have um hi debra i don't think you are still audible um so i'll just um, you know uh, take over and talk a little bit um, about uh, Education USA before we open up the floor for question and answers. Um, so Education USA is a US State Department supported network which provides accurate, comprehensive, and current information on studying in the US. We have over 430 centers in over 170 countries. Um, if you can move to the slide, Deborah. <clears throat> there are seven centers in India. They are located in Ahmedabad, Bangalore, Chennai, Hyderabad, Kolkata, Mumbai, and New Delhi. If you need advice on how to go about selecting universities, as well as any step in um, the application process, such as writing essays or applying for financial aid, our advisors are available to help you do feel free to contact a center near you. Next slide, please. You can locate, um, you can locate a center near you in India or in any other country on website educationusa.state.gov. We would also highlight that we have a page on the Education USA website with resources to help students with disabilities applying to US universities. Please do look up this web page for more information. Next slide, please. Finally, do feel free to follow the US Consulate General Mumbai and Education USA India on our social media channels. Do follow us for useful information and to stay updated with our sessions. We will open the floor now for question and answers. Um, my first question to the panel is, and we can start with Monica as we went, um, you know, with the um, order of presentation. Um, my first question is, at what stage should I disclose my disability? And should I disclose at all? Thank you, that's a good question. I think this is a common concern and question for many students. Um, and we cannot just deny the discrimination um, in the US for, or across the world for people with disabilities. And so many students will um, disclose their disability after they've been admitted to the university. Um, it's never required for the application process unless you need accommodations. So maybe the application is not fully accessible, so you might need to request accommodations. You don't have to fully disclose um, all your disability details, but just your needs to have an accessible application. Um, some students do not disclose until they arrive to campus and understand more about the campus and resources that are available. Um, it is recommended to disclose your disability related needs um, after the application process, especially for international students, um, since it can take time to adjust to the accommodations and get those accommodations in place. Thank you, Monica. Mm -hmm. um, Justin, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, I have to echo what Monica said. Um, the one thing to know for sure is that um, when it comes to a disability resource center, I say by all means come to our office and disclose that. We've had students who come and say, you know, this is my disability. I'm not sure I need accommodations or want accommodations. I at least want you to know. And so know that when you come and disclose it to a disability resource center, we typically would not, we keep that very private. And so we don't share that unless we have your permission to do so. Um, and so otherwise, we just talk about your accommodations. So if an instructor or you know an employee or someone were to call um, and ask us if you what your disability is, 
we don't go into those details without your permission to do so. Um, so do at least know that when you're coming to a disability resource center and disclosing a disability, we keep that as private as we possibly can. Thank you, Justin. Um, Sunny, would you like to add anything from your personal experience? Um, yeah, so as Monica said, all of my information was private and like not disclosed to everybody. I only disclosed my disability when I was comfortable to, and I really, really appreciated that. Um, there, there were a lot of people that have approached me um, you know, about my disability and I've just been able to say that, sorry, I can't discuss that, you know. Um, so that's always a pretty helpful one. Yeah. Thank you, Sunny. Uh, my next question again to the um, panel is, um, um, and I think Monica and Justin uh, can talk about this. Are there scholarships for disabled students? Monica, would you like to go? Yeah, um, I mentioned this slightly, but there's rarely um, scholarships for people with disabilities to study in the U.S., but it's more scholarships for all students. And the State Department has scholarships such as the Fulbright program um, that are really doing a lot of work to um, get more diverse applicants, including students with disabilities. So they really are doing more outreach um, and intentional targeting to diverse um, groups of people, including disabled people, to make sure that they are um, accepting and applying for these um, scholarships. And they do provide accommodations as well. So that's another benefit of applying for these programs is that they will also include and support you through that um, accommodation process. And on our website, we do have a list of different um, scholarships and different resources to look at. So how our organization does not provide scholarships ourselves, but we try to collect um, web pages or different scholarships so we can collect it on one page of where you can look um, for different scholarships. Well, that's great. Thank you, Monica. Justin, mm -hmm. do you want to add to this? Yes, absolutely. So there certainly are scholarships for people with disabilities, um, but also don't um, be afraid to apply for any scholarship that's not disability related. Um, I know here at Missouri State, the way our system works is that if you apply for a scholarship through our Missouri State system, it automatically applies you for basically anything we offer at Missouri State. And so here we have three that offer um, specific to students with disabilities. And it it's also helpful to search for scholarships related specifically to your disability. So for example, here at our university, we have one that was a endowment donation by someone who um, was really specific and passionate to folks who, um, um, who are blind. And so one of the criteria for that scholarship was, um, you know, we really want this to go to someone who uh, may be blind. And so that actually can really narrow the pull down for you. If you live with that disability, you're not competing against hundreds, so you might be competing against two or three other people if that's only um, so many people that's applied. And so um, definitely search for different scholarships related to your disability because you might be surprised on what's out there that can provide you support. Thank you, Justin. Sunny, do you want to add anything um, other than what Monica and Justin have said? No, I think I'm good. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, but we do have a question coming from the audience. Um, and the question is about that the discussion kind of centered around physical ability, disabilities. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, learning disabilities such as dyslexia and what kind of accommodations um, are available to students and how they can access those? Monica, would you like to go? Oops, wrong button. <laughs> um, Justin, I think would be great since he works on coordinating those accommodations. Sure, Justin, please go ahead. Yes. And, um, so when it comes to dyslexia, you know, like I said, we're going to tailor it individually to you. But some of the things that we that initially kind of come to mind is, you know, it might be extended time on your exam just because, you know, it's going to take you a little bit longer to maybe read that exam and make sure you can um, get the information so you can uh, express what you've learned. Um, another thing too is uh, that alternative textbooks accommodation, alternative format, where maybe it's helpful for you to um, hear the um, hear it being read to you. Doesn't mean you don't you're not reading, but you can also hear it while it's going on. Um, you know, and sometimes is there certain technology that might be available to you? It kind of just depends on what um, you know what you find 
what we see that might work for you. Um, so because I'm thinking of actually about my cousin who um, lives with dyslexia, and if it's a paper book, he really has trouble reading, but if you put it on a computer screen, it's like night and day for that person. And so um, maybe it's just making sure that we can get everything in a digital format so it can go on a computer screen, just however that kind of, that might affect you. So um, those are some initial things that I would um, think about, but that's something that we can certainly, you know, any disability resource officer can talk to you about um, and ensure that you have the proper accommodations. Thank you, um, Justin. I'll move on to the uh, next question. Uh, the question is, are there any scholarships available to international students who only want to study American Sign Language? Um, Justin, would you like to talk about this and then we can go to Monica? Yeah, um, I am, I'm honestly not sure. There, there's so many scholarships out there that I wouldn't be surprised, um, but I'm not honestly sure about that. Um, this is Monica. I, I believe RIT, um, not RIT, Gallaudet University does have some scholarships for international students um, coming to learn English or coming to learn ASL. So I would direct you to the international office at Gallaudet University. Um, I haven't heard of that many other um, scholarships for international students wanting to learn um, ASL, but I know Gallaudet has a really strong program. Thank you. Um, the next question is uh, again for Justin and Monica that does indicating disability impact the admissions decision in any way? Monica, do you want to go with that? Sure. Um, it does not impact the decision. Um, sometimes <clears throat> other scholarship opportunities, a student might hold back on disclosing their disability, but it, if it's part of your story, um, it's part of why you're studying in the U.S., part of your degree studies, your long-term professional academic goals, then it is important to um, share that personal story or not to feel that um, you'll be denied admission or anything like that. Uh, um, yeah, so it doesn't usually come at the admission process, but you would not be denied, and that's when it can go through. You're protected by the ADA for those reasons, that you do not get denied admission based on a disability or any other um, diverse identity. Thank you, that's a great insight. Um, I would actually like to ask Sunny if you want to add anything from your personal experience in writing essays for the um, admission. Um, I think I've added everything to when I was talking about my experience. So I think that's, I, I think I've stated everything, but I would like to just say one final thing that, um, you like despite whatever disability you may or may not have um the world is your oyster you know you can go ahead and try and achieve whatever you can and not let small things you know like oh like should i dis disclose my disability should i oh my god i cannot apply to this university because it does not have so and so um i feel like those things shouldn't stop you from applying if you feel that that's part of your dream then you should go for it and you should try your best to try and get to wherever you want to justin would you like to add anything more to this yeah the only thing i would add is that um, when it comes to admissions to university the credentialing and the requirements to get into that said university is the same as they're not any non-disabled student too. So there's not like an alternative admissions process because you have a disability or anything like that. So know that if you're being accepted, it's because you did the hard work and you're, you're allowed to go there. And so, um, yeah, you shouldn't have to worry about that. Awesome, thank you. Um, my next question is that if, um, you know, someone needs support from a a personal assistant, can they come with them to the US? Monica, do you want to go ahead? <clears throat> yeah, this is Monica. I um, don't want to get into too much detail because I might get into the immigration side of things, but we have seen um, international students who've brought a personal care attendant with them who could be their mother, um, their friend, um, because it can be more expensive to, to you know, buy those services or purchase those services in the U.S. And usually the attendant will apply for a tourist visa and apply under the notation as a personal care attendant. 
Um, so they still have those requirements of only staying for six months at a time, but usually the consulate will make a notation stating tourist visa, but um, personal care attendant. So that is something that you would have to talk to the consulate about um, and talk to the international office to see those restrictions. But it is something that I've seen done um, in the past by people who are um, in power wheelchairs and have a lot more need um, for daily living skills. And so um, definitely is a possibility. And we've seen different scholarships from the State Department um, where people who have that requirement too and so, yeah, I, I would check on with those visa requirements, but it has been done with under that notation. Justin, would you like to add anything? Yeah, when it comes to personal care attendance, so that's where even the Disability Resource Center um, can help with accommodation is that basically in terms of our accommodation memo, we would list that a personal care attendant might be coming along to class. Um, or also maybe if you need that personal care attendant for your living needs in the rest halls to make sure that they have access to your room or if they need to stay there or whatever the case may be. Um, the one clarifier that we would always want to make sure um, with the personal care attendant, especially if you're coming, they're coming to class with you, is ensuring that understand they're just kind of attend, helping you with those physical related needs, but they're not necessarily there to teach the course or to help help you with your exam or things of that sort. They're kind of just acting as an extension of you. So you just want to make sure that you're keeping that in mind because we also want to keep academic integrity um, in mind. We don't want you to get in trouble. Thank you. That's an important insight. Um, the next question is kind of a follow-up question to what I just asked. Um, someone wants to know that um, how does a university go about assigning a caretaker for a student on a wheelchair, um, you know, suffering from um, any kind of muscular disability, for example? Christine, would you like to go uh, for that question? I want to make sure I understand the question. So how do we go assigning a caretaker? Is that what I heard? Correct. Um, well, I want to make sure I understand. So there's a personal care attendant um, where either you can bring one or if you are finding one here in the States. So there's usually um, centers maybe in, in major cities called Centers for Independent Living, where they might have a list of people who would provide those services or help connect you with those services. And so um, I know a previous colleague who um, would consult with that area and they'd actually have a list of people that would um, hopefully be vetted by that organization that he could potentially hire to be his personal care attendant. Um, that's the best way that I've known about it. Uh, Monica, I don't know if you have any ideas to add to that, but that's always kind of um, what I've understood. The one thing I will say, there's a personal care attendant, but then sometimes in the um, college experience, you might have what's called a lab assistant if you maybe are not able to, um, like for example, we had a student who didn't have the use of their hands. Well, they still needed to take a chemistry class here at Missouri State. And so what the lab assistant did was, you know, the student would tell the lab assistant, hey, pour 20 milliliters of this chemical into the solution. And so the lab assistant would do that, but it was still the student who needed to record the information or let the instructor know what happened. Um, so we have those types of services too. And if it's a lab assistant, that's an accommodation that you don't have to worry about paying for. That's all part of the accommodation process here. But if it's a personal care attendant that's kind of helping with your daily living and needs and things of that sort, that that's outside our scope as a as a university. But what we can do is make sure that the the university knows the personal care attendant will come along with you and what you need to do. Yeah, and this is Monica. That's what I was just going to clarify too. Is the difference of um, who's coordinating a personal care attendant, and usually that is the student hiring somebody if it's bringing somebody from overseas or finding somebody locally um, for that support for any personal care um, and daily living skills. Thank you, Monica. <clears throat> the next question is, uh, what accommodations are provided for students with learning difficulties? Um, also, you know, for example, ADHD or ADD, um, you know, uh, for such students, what kind of accommodations would be provided? Monica, would you like to go first? Or Justin, <laughs> do you want to take that one since you're providing? Sure, you? sure this is Justin. So, yeah, um, it'd probably be similar to maybe with the student living with dyslexia, where, you know, lots of times the ADHD or learning disabilities um, is just having a 
a little more time on that test to be able to accomplish the exam. Um, especially when I think about ADHD, I think about, um, you know, distraction, absolutely. And so maybe it's not being in a classroom filled with 100, 200, 300 people. It might be, we have a testing center here. And so you can have your own cubicle so that you don't have to be distracted by people getting up or someone clicking their pen or something like that. Um, it could be, um, you know, I'm thinking about learning disabilities. Um, you know, once again, it might be a, a different kind of format for your textbook. Um, and also note taking pops to mind. So like, for example, we're using a really new uh, cool system that records the lecture, but on your laptop, you can actually type notes alongside the lecture or make a little notation to go back and review it. And so maybe if you have ADHD and you know, you got really distracted or something was going on that you just couldn't keep your attention on the instructor, you would have access back to the recording and to your notes to see maybe what you've missed or if you know you've missed it, you can click something to say, hey, go back to this and, and review that. Um, so like I said, it's tailored to the individual, but you know, extended time, um, note taking, those are some pretty typical ones that we see with ADHD as well as learning disabilities. Thank you, Justin. Um, my next question is, what kind of accommodations are available for standardized testing required in the application process? Um, before you guys answer that question, I would like to add that, um, you know, accommodations for exams such as PSAT and AP exams that we conduct for College Board uh, do provide accommodations, uh, but they need to be approved by the College Board first. Um, um, uh, Justin, would you like to go ahead? Sure. So um, that's a really great question because, so when I talked to you earlier, you know, here at Missouri State, we really, we're not so documentation heavy. We want to really just hear from you. And if we can base accommodations based on your story, that's what we rely on so, rather than documentation. But this is a great point that when it comes to maybe entrance exams into a university, or if you've graduated from a university and you want to go to graduate school, um, maybe you have to take the LSAT, the GMAT, the GRE, whatever that exam might be that accommodations process is separate from the university. And typically those processes are more stringent than what the university is. So that's something to keep in mind because sometimes a, a big common one that students have ran into um, trouble with is that maybe the entrance exam or this board wants to have recent documentation and that might be within the past three years. Well, if you've been in the US um, you know, studying for four years, the documentation that you might have provided to your disability resource center, they may not accept that. And so that's something to keep in mind as you are navigating, um, you know, entrance to a university or graduate school, um, because I understand, at least here in the United States, I know that testing for those types of things is not cheap whatsoever. And so um, it's just something to keep in mind um, that they're pretty stringent on that and don't usually make too many exceptions. Um, so that's a really great question. I'm glad you asked. Thank you, Justin. Uh, Monica, anything else that you would like to add to that? Yeah, we have some resources on our website um, because there's <clears throat> many different types of exams that students have to take for entrance exams for admission. And so it's kind of navigating those resources, but we've seen um, students who might need a reader during the exams or an alternative format of the exam to, um, sent to them or sent to the testing location um, that does need a lot of coordination because it's you know an office space in the US with maybe coordination with your home and maybe it's in um, English you know just many or a student we've had a student who um, they mailed documents to but he was blind and so that kind of coordination of the materials that we're sending we needed them to also send it electronically or in Braille and there's different formats um, of Braille as well and so that there's just a lot of things that need to be communicated to the testing agency in order to coordinate those court, um, exam court, um, accommodations. And so we have a lot of resources on our website to know exactly where to go and what those steps are. And we would recommend at least planning six months in advance with your advisor and with the testing organization to apply for those accommodations with the testing agency. Um, like Justin said, it's not in coordination with your university. So it's kind of an, another external um, agency that has a lot of their own unique um, and heavy requirements sometimes of paperwork. Um, thank you, Monica. Um, I think we have time only for last two questions now. Um, uh, the second last question is, as an international student, 
um, you know, does one need to have documentation for their disability and what kind of documentation would that be? Justin, would you like to begin? Yes, so um, as I stated before, hopefully, you know, hopefully your university is not so reliant on documentation, but it's best to bring it if you have it. So um, one thing you can do is when you go to, if you've found a program in a university that you would like to go to, go to that Disability Resource Center website, because what they should do is outline on their website the type of documentation that they may require or are looking for. Um, and so, you know, some things, like I said, it could be just a letter that talks about, here's your diagnosis, here's some of the barriers related to that. Um, but I know sometimes where if you're living with a, um, you know, a learning disability, you might have had to go through a certain battery of different tests. And so there's different scores and things of that sort that you might have received. And so that information is really helpful um, for the uh disability service professional as well to see those discrepancies and that sort of thing. So they might ask for that. And that's actually probably um, good to have too if you decide to do graduate school, because they'll certainly want to see those types of scores and that sort of thing. Um, so um, to be safe, I would definitely say bring um, documentation. Um, but you know, and I'm not trying to make a too flippant of a joke here, but the example I give to other uh, you know, folks is that you know, if we have someone who is a, um, you know, they may have a service animal and they may have their cane and it's pretty obvious that this person's blind, I'm not going to ask them to provide me medical documentation that tells me they're blind, right? That seems a little silly. So that's why I kind of say that rule is the more non-apparent your disability might be, the higher likelihood you might be asked to provide medical documentation. Thank you, Justin. Monica, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think, you know, I agree with Justin and I've, if there's any way to um, pre-screen any of the documents or kind of confirm, as Justin was saying, um, the documentation you do have will be accepted in the U.S. sometimes. Um, I remember working with a student, an ESL student, who had to apply for testing accommodations um, for a learning disability and all the documentation that was done from his home country was not accepted by the testing agency because some of the things were inconsistent, some signatures were missing. And so if there's any doubt or questions about it, if it's back home, if you can confirm, you know, everything is okay, or if there's the Disability Resource Center that you can connect with in the US, just to make sure if there's anything additional that you can do when you're home, then it's better to get that done when you're home rather than having to, to deal with it and handle it whenever you're studying in the U.S. and then you realize you need another signature or an updated form. Thank you, Monica. Uh, now is the last question and I would start with Sunny here. Um, Sunny, um, can you share, you know, some of your thoughts about, you know, how a uh, disabled applicant can consider, you know, when looking at locations um, of a U.S. university, can, you know, um, give, you know, um, from your experiences, what was important? So I um, basically looked at um, how far the university was for my, any of my closest relatives that I might need to depend on. Um, that was one factor. Another factor was how independent I can be and like what kind of area is it. So um, staying at Stanford, um, I had several close friends that I know I can depend on. So that was one of the major reasons why I chose to go to Stanford for grad school. Because I know that um, in case of any issues, I know that I have several deaf friends, you know, that I can depend on and I, I can ask questions and get resources for other deaf resources around the Bay Area. The other factor that I thought about was, um, you know, um, the, um, speech and pathology clinic near the university and how good it is. And if I can schedule an appointment with an audiologist just in case I need to program my cochlear implant. So the procedure involved with that, um, I had to like do several research. And so I talked to the speech therapy center that I went to in Mumbai. I asked them if they knew 
um, people in the United States um, near my area that I can actually contact and then get to know different researchers. Um, and surprisingly, like around in Stanford, like once I paid the university insurance, um, I can actually go and pay like a super small fee and actually get my cochlear implants mapped. So that might be one factor that you might want to look into, seeing that sometimes the audiology appointment might be too expensive, you know, without insurance and stuff like that. So that might be another factor that you might want to look into. That's great insight, um, Sunny. Can I just add to that question before I go to Justin and Monica? Can you um, just give maybe just one piece of advice um, to students with disability, you know, who are thinking about applying to US universities? Just real quick. This I is Justin. Say that oh. Did not... oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sunny. Um, I forgot. Go ahead. I Go would ahead. say that do not let yourself be restricted by your disability and that it's an important part of who you are. And if, like, that's just all I can say that, you know, do not let your disability restrict you because I know that that's partly what I've been brought up with and it took, like, uh, some a long time to like unlearn all of that ableist thinking, you know. So just the world is yours. So you know, go for it. Go for your dream. Whatever you want to make it happen, just go and try your best to try and make it happen. That's a great um, advice, Sunny. Thank you for that. Um, Justin, um, coming to you, can you just add to what you know Sunny has already said about you know factors that can play a role in selecting location of a university. Sure. My, you know, my biggest piece of advice is, um, as Monica had stated earlier in her presentation, is find the programs that you're interested in and then really kind of just research the university and research the Disability Resource Center there and search for those terms like universal design. Look at, look at their diversity and inclusion website. See some of the things and the initiatives that they're doing, because one thing you can probably get from those different websites is kind of seeing what the, what's the culture of that campus. You know, we might have someone saying that diversity and inclusion is important, but maybe that's just words and they're not actually backing it up with action. And so you wanna look for those universities that are actually backing it up with actions. They may say, here's our strategic plan. Here's the things we're doing in the community. Look at the programs that we're doing with our international students and our students with disabilities. Those are kind of the programs that you might go, okay, they, they actually mean what they're saying and maybe I wanna go there and be a part of that. Um, it doesn't mean you shouldn't go to those other schools either, but just realize that the, you know, maybe there might be a little bit more difficult time or maybe just their philosophy might be a little different than what you were hoping, but it doesn't mean by all means you shouldn't go there. Um, and I think to echo Sunny, you know, don't be restricted um, or feel like you don't have any rights to a certain university or an experience. Um, one thing to realize is that you're navigating a world that wasn't designed for you to succeed, okay? And so when you're coming to a university and when you're coming to a program or coming to whatever, um, realize that you're more prepared than you, than you realize because you probably had to do things two or three, four different ways to accomplish certain tasks that someone else only had to do at once. And so that's what I always tell students when they're going to the job field is that know that you're probably more qualified than those who without a disability because you navigated four or five different systems in five or six different ways. So if you think in your head that you do not have rights to this experience or you're not prepared, please realize you're more prepared than you realize. Thank you, Justin. Monica? Yeah, thank you. I, you know, yeah, second everything that Justin and Sunny said and, you know, we're all so different and just really pay attention to what your goals are. So you've attended this webinar, so you're already thinking about studying in the US. So there's something already stirring that's attracting you to pull you to come all the way to the US for your studies. Is it for your studies and you've, you know, very academic focus with, I want this degree in education or whatever it might be, then look for those programs. Um, there's thousands of universities to choose from in the US. And then also think about what other experiences, if you're coming as an undergraduate, that's four years, it's <laughs> a long time. Uh, what else, what other activities, you know, what else fulfills you? Is it being around other international students by a lot of diverse students or um, being close to mountains or the beach or, you know, the U.S. is such a diverse landscape. So 
think about all of the opportunities um, that you have here. And, you know, of course, access is really important. So connecting with the disability office and you want that close relationship with your international office, with your disability office and have that comfort because the adjustment, you know, is there's going to be an adjustment there. So connecting with advisors that you feel comfortable with and how they're communicating with you. Um, and just something else, you know, I always recommend um, international students with disabilities also plan to arrive a little bit early. Um, we've talked about the adjustment of accommodations and finding those accommodations or maybe not disclosing until you arrive to campus. And there are some different accommodations that you may not have had um, back home. And so giving yourself time to adjust to a campus, navigate the physical space, and realize what accommodations you have access to, and then seeing if it fits. And so then maybe a week into it, you're like, no, <laughs> that's not gonna work and you might need to change it. But you know, if you realize too late and there's a lot of international student orientations and activities happening right when you get to campus and that can kind of cause a lot of stress um, unnecessarily. But if you can arrive a little bit early, just to set, you know, more calm and get adjusted to that space and then be better. And yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I think it's an exciting, you know, big opportunity. And I shifted from UT Austin, seeing that there wasn't that many students with disabilities that were studying at this incredible campus to shift my career, to focus on these opportunities to tell more students, apply, <laughs> apply income and study in the US because it's for you as well. Thank you. Um, I don't have any piece of advice. Sorry, I just have one piece of advice. Sure. Um, one thing is that as, as an international student, when you're new to campus and you don't know anything around or something, I, I, I would recommend that you first go to Google because that's where you'll find a lot of your answers. If not, you can always go to someone in your department, like email an advisor, someone they would at least be able to connect you to someone that's more appropriate. Um, so that might be a good starting point if you don't know where to go on campus and stuff like that. So that's something to keep in mind. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I know that we've you know, had a lot of questions and we couldn't take all of these questions. So please write to us and we can you know, provide you with the right resources if you need to. Um, this session has been recorded, so the recording will be available in a couple of days. So please let us know if you are interested in the recording and we will share that with you. Um, and to, to end the session, you know, we, I would really like to um, thank all the panelists, um, you know, uh, great information valuable information and also um you know for you know you had to wake up so early so we really appreciate that um also thank you to u.s consulate general mumbai for hosting this with ed usa thank you again to all the panelists and um attendees um have a great evening or morning thank you guys thank you